Hello, I'm Debbie Powell, and I serve as the Deputy Associate Commissioner and the Acting Associate Commissioner for the Family and Youth Services Bureau, or FISB. We lie at the Administration for Children and Families, and I provide senior leadership for three FISB grant programs, one of which is the Adolescent Pregnancy Prevention Programs, also known as the APP program. On behalf of FISB and specifically the Division of Optimal Adolescent Development, where the APP programs are administered, we welcome you and are excited that you have joined us virtually for orientation for the new FY21 grantees. We are appreciative of your commitment to implement effective personal responsibility education programs and sexual risk avoidance education prevention services throughout the United States and US territories. We acknowledge the challenges of delivering services during a pandemic. However, we are very happy and proud that grantees have continued to reach hundreds of young people given this monumental barrier. Many of you have proven to be tremendous leaders and advocates who have advanced FISB's understanding and programming in the field. We are very proud to call you partners. I'd like to thank all of you for your hard work and your diligence in responding to our APP Notice of Funding Opportunity Announcement in July and commend you on submitting such thorough and well-developed applications. And it goes without saying, congratulations, not only on your successful applications, but in your commitment to foster the growth and success of at-risk youth in your communities. I'm very pleased to say that FISB awarded a total of $52 million in SRAE and PREP grants to 89 organizations that work every day to prevent adolescent pregnancy and for some to prevent sexually transmitted infections, including HIV and AIDS. We can't wait to see and help foster your success in providing effective adolescent pregnancy prevention programming to help prepare youth for a brighter future. Of course, you're already familiar with the APP program as evidenced by those applications, but today's orientation provides the opportunity to look closely at the interworkings of the legislation, the processes and practices for properly managing your grant and the resources available to help you do so. There'll be a lot of information thrown at you provided today, and it's essential for you to understand how and where it factors into your work. So get comfortable, be engaged, and ready for our question and answer period at the end of the presentation. Let me share a little bit of what will be presented to you during this orientation. We will introduce you to our awesome FISB staff. We will provide an overview of FISB and the APP programs and requirements. We will review the guiding legislation for your work. Introduce you to training and technical assistance resources and partners. Present an overview of the role of the grants office and resources that are available to grantees. Plus, we will show you some of the readily available tools and resources at your disposal, like the Exchange, which is a awesome interactive activation platform for APP grantees, partners, and stakeholders to help increase the visibility and impact of your efforts to prevent pregnancy among our most vulnerable youth. And last but certainly not least, the We Think Twice campaign, designed to promote healthy relationships, goal setting, 
and empowerment among youth. You'll also learn about the support that our team provides for building data capacity and local evaluations. We highly encourage you to conduct continuous quality improvement and local evaluations that will further our understanding of the anticipated outcomes and impact of your projects and to demonstrate our projects effective. Once again, I am very happy to welcome you to the APP program. And remember, FISB is always here to provide you the assistance, the guidance, the resources, and support you need to be successful in all aspects of your programs. Once again, congratulations, good luck, and thank you for your continued commitment to our youth. Welcome and congratulations again to all the newly awarded competitive prep grantees. My name is Christine Zakor and I'm a federal project officer with the Adolescent Pregnancy Prevention Program. I will guide you through the first part of today's webinar before handing it over to my colleagues. Today's orientation is divided into nine parts and a question and answer session. Following introductions, I'll provide an overview of the Family and Youth Services Bureau, or FISB, and the Adolescent Pregnancy Prevention Program, or APP program. We will then review the purpose and requirements of the competitive prep program. Next, we'll review the roles and responsibilities of the program office. I'll then hand it over to Bernard Morgan, sorry, from the Office of Grants Management so he can share the roles and responsibilities of their office. Next, we'll hear from our contractors and partners on prep performance measures, local evaluation support, and training and technical assistance. And finally, we'll hear from Labrita White as she provides information on the medical accuracy review as well as some closing remarks. At the end, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. On the next slide, I'm going to be introducing our FISB staff. First is our leadership team. Debbie Powell, who we just heard from, is the Acting Associate Commissioner for FISB. Courtney Gaskins is the Director of the Division of Optimal Adolescent Development, which the Adolescent Pregnancy Prevention Program falls under. Labrita White is the Program Manager. Next slide, please. Now to introduce our staff and federal project officers within the Adolescent Pregnancy Prevention Program. The APP project officers include Renee Martin, Patrice Moss, Tanya Matthews, Leticia Winston, Jessica Johnson, me, Christine Zakor, Katie Derrick, Ricky Richard, Latonia Coriat, Megan Hill, and Alexandria Washington. Our program is also supported by Tarshika Thompson, Executive Assistant, and Owen Burns, Communication Manager. Next slide. The Family and Youth Services Bureau, or FISB, is located within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Administration on Children, Youth, and Families. There are four divisions within FISB. The Adolescent Pregnancy Prevention Program falls within the Division of Optimal Adolescent Development. Next slide. The PrEP program is designed to educate adolescents on abstinence and contraception to prevent pregnancy and STIs, including HIV and AIDS. Projects must incorporate at least three of six adulthood preparation subjects, which include healthy relationships, adolescent development, financial literacy, parent-child communication, educational and career success, and healthy life skills. There are four PrEP funding streams, which include state PrEP, competitive PrEP, tribal PrEP, and personal responsibility education innovative strategies, also known as PRIUS. Next slide. The APP program administers 275 grants through seven funding streams throughout the nation and several U.S. territories. Several new grants were awarded in FY 2021, including 27 new competitive prep grants 
for a total of almost $15 million. Next slide. Now I will review the competitive prep, purpose, and requirements. The legislation specifies that the competitive prep program is to be administered by the Department of Health and Human Services and eligible applicants were limited to organizations and entities in states or territories that opted not to accept the allocated PrEP funds. Eligible applicants were limited to local organizations and entities, including faith-based organizations or consortia located in Florida, Indiana, Kansas, North Dakota, Texas, Virginia, American Samoa, and Marshall Islands. These were the states and the territories that did not accept the state allocations for PrEP funding. This may be familiar to you from the notice of uh, funding opportunity, but to review again, the overall goal of the competitive PrEP program is to educate adolescents on both abstinence and contraception for the prevention of pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections, including HIV AIDS. The objectives of the program are to replicate evidence-based effective programs or incorporate elements of effective programs that are proven to change behaviors including delaying sexual activity, increasing condom and contraceptive use for sexually active youth, or reducing pregnancy among youth. Implement curricula that includes medically accurate information, reference in peer-reviewed publications by educational, scientific, governmental, or health organizations, and is age-appropriate, culturally appropriate, and inclusive. Promote successful and healthy transitions to adulthood through the implementation of at least three of the six adulthood preparation subjects and target prevention education to youth between the ages of 10 and 19, pregnant and parenting youth under 21 years of age, and youth who are at high risk of becoming pregnant or who have special circumstances. All competitive prep programs must address the requirements of the Notice of Funding Opportunity, which I'll also refer to as the NOFO. This is also known as the Funding Opportunity Announcement or FOA. Over the next several slides, I'll walk you through each of the requirements as outlined in the NOFO. Programs must place substantial emphasis on both abstinence and contraception education for the prevention of pregnancy and STIs, including HIV and AIDS. They must incorporate three of six adulthood preparation subjects listed and replicate evidence-based effective programs or substantially incorporate elements of effective programs. Additionally, next slide, thank you. Sorry, the slide before that, there we go. Additionally, programs must maintain fidelity to the original evidence-based or effective program model or consult with developers to obtain approval of proposed adaptations. They must also be medically and age and culturally appropriate and provide referrals to healthcare and other services. One important note to highlight is that programs cannot pay for referral services with their grant funds. Next slide. Programs should target services to youth who are most high risk for pregnancy or STIs or have other special circumstances, including youth in foster care, youth experiencing homelessness, youth with HIV and AIDS, victims of human trafficking, pregnant youth who are under 21 years of age, mothers who are under 21 years of age, and youth residing in areas with extremely high teen birth rates compared to all youth within the state or territory. Next slide. Programs must also include a positive youth development approach and trauma-informed care to program implementation. Also programs must collect and report on the required PrEP performance measures. There are three categories of performance measures, which include measures of structure, cost, and support, measures of attendance, reach, and dosage, and participants' characteristics, behaviors, program experiences, and perceptions of program effects, which are collected through entry and exit surveys. We'll talk a little bit more about those later in the webinar. 
Next slide. If programs conduct a local evaluation, which is optional, no more than 20% of the total budget may be allocated towards conducting the evaluation. Programs also needed to agree to participate in a federal evaluation if they were selected. And finally, programs must develop a project sustainability plan to ensure that program activities continue after federal funding ends. There are also several post-award requirements for the competitive prep grantees, which were outlined in the NOFO. These include implementing the full functioning project and starting to serve youth within 90 days following the notice of award for the grant. Formally training facilitators or educators in the program model or elements of the program by professionals who can provide follow-up technical assistance to facilitators registering and budgeting the cost for two key staff persons to attend the three-day Adolescent Pregnancy Prevention Grantee Conference annually. In 2022, it will be tentatively held in Atlanta, Georgia, or through a virtual platform. And also registering and budgeting the cost for spending a minimum of two staff persons to attend at least one of two topical training sessions offered each year for the project period. In addition, and some of this may be repeated, the competitive prep grantees are required to collect and report biannually on all of the OMB approved federal performance measures. This applies to the prime recipient, partners, and any subrecipients. They must agree to participate in the national evaluation if selected. For those conducting local evaluations, they must participate in training and technical assistance and follow related guidance provided by CISB, which we'll learn more about later in today's webinar. And also participate in a medical accuracy review of selected curricula sponsored by CISB. You'll also hear more about this process later in the webinar. Next slide. Oh, thanks. Competitive prep grantees will be required to submit a performance progress report or PPR on a semi-annual basis you can find more information about the PPR, including the template, due dates, and how to submit it in the competitive prep guidance document, which you should have received last week from your assigned federal project officer. Next slide. Through the PPR, you'll report on program indicators, including major activities and accomplishments during the period, challenges and problems, significant findings and events, dissemination activities, other activities, and activities planned for the next reporting period. Later in the webinar, Bernard with the Office of Grants Management will share more information about the PPR and due date. Now we'll discuss the roles and responsibilities of the APP Program Office. The Program Office reviews applications and programmatic reports, responds to programmatic and technical aspects of the grant, ensures the amounts to be awarded to grantees are consistent with current statutory requirements and monitors grantee performance. Project officers or POs are the contact person for any programmatic changes or updates. On this slide are examples of their duties and when you should contact your PO. For example, regarding programmatic requirements, program modifications or changes in project scope, budget revisions, changes in key staff positions, program progress reports, monitoring and site visits, and technical assistance. PO's main objectives are to ensure that the project is in compliance with the terms and conditions and the authorizing legislation, discuss the project's development and observe the project during implementation, and provide programmatic financial and evaluative guidance and determine any technical assistance needs. Ongoing technical assistance, oops, the previous slide, thank you. Ongoing technical assistance is provided through emails, webinars, conference calls, virtual meetings, and site visits and site monitoring visits. Next slide, please. Grantee site visits and monitoring are essential to the responsibility of project officers. Your project officer will discuss the scheduling of site visits um, with you in the future. The objectives of those visits are to 
ensure compliance with the terms and conditions of the grant and authorizing legislation, to discuss program implementation and observe program implementation, learn about innovative and promising practices, provide programmatic financial and evaluative guidance, and to assess for technical assistance needs. Next slide. Now I'll turn it over to my colleague in the Office of Grants Management, Bernard Morgan, who will provide you with information on the roles and responsibilities of the Office of Grants Management, the fiscal management of your grant and other reporting requirements. Bernard. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Bernard Morgan and I am one of the assigned uh, grants management specialists for these new awards. What I'm gonna do real quick is go over the Office of Grants Management roles and responsibilities. And I just wanna thank you for uh, taking the time to participate in this orientation. It is very informative. It has a lot of information, but what I like to say is we're here all year around so that we can be here to help you. So please uh, bear with me. I'll try not to be uh, boring and get through this. The role of the Grants Management Office is uh, we, we are responsible for the fiscal management and administration of the grant award. Uh, we ensure compliance with applicable laws, regulations, policies, and procedures, and technical aspects of the grants and its fiscal monitoring. Uh, we provide guidance on fiscal requirements related to the grant awards, the terms and conditions, and any post-award changes that may come up. And we're also responsible uh, for reporting and the closeout procedures. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you can contact OGM or your specifically assigned grants management specialist uh, to request changes and key personnel, budget modifications, carryovers, or no cost extensions. Uh, just a quick fact, no cost extensions are only done at the end of the project period, but I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, any clarification on budget issues, particularly uh, regarding allowable costs. Uh, this is another thing that uh, you should pay close attention to. Uh, when you receive your notice of award, there are a set of remarks at the, at the bottom of your notice of award. Make sure everything, you read through those remarks, make sure there's nothing that's missing or that needs to be followed up on. Uh, we also provide guidance on submitting fiscal reports and other official correspondence. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, payment management services. This is the main uh, system that houses where you will be drawing your funds from and you will be providing your reports to. So part of the HHS Program Support Center, which is separate from ACF, please understand payment management system is a separate government entity. Uh, we do work hand in hand with them, but they are a separate entity. So if you do have issues with payment management system, you will have to contact them directly, but you can also uh, contact us just so you can, we can uh, see if we can help you first. But if it's a direct issue with that system, you would have to contact them directly. But PMS provides the payment and accounting system for all HHS grants. Grantees are responsible for requesting payments and reporting disbursements to the payment management system. Grantees must spend funds within 72 hours after requesting drawdown. So that means when you make that drawdown, it is for an immediate expenditure. Next slide. Um, payment management system does require quarterly reporting uh, via their, uh, their own system. This quarterly reporting is for the federal cash transaction report, which is separate from your regular, uh, I believe you guys are on a semi-annual reporting as well for your uh, financial status report. So there's two separate reports. One is uh, done, done quarterly, one is done semi-annually. You can visit the PMS website, uh, as you can see here, for quarterly FFR due dates and find your PMS account contact info for PMS access assistance or any drawdown questions. And the PMS phone number is 877-614-5533. Um, one other thing uh, before we move on, uh, PMS has 
on their website uh, several training videos and uh, a guide for their system that is very helpful for new grantees. I recommend everybody take the time to go to the PMS website and on there you will find individual trainings videos and things of that nature that will be helpful for you during the uh, project period. Next slide, please. Submission of federal financial status reports and program progress reports. And we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but we're going to go in a little deeper. Your program progress reports are due semi-annually. You submit your PPR report through the reports tab in Grant Solutions. You should all have access to Grant Solutions, uh, either your grant, grant authorizing official, your PIPD, or any support staff. There are a couple of roles that are support staff under the grant or, grantee authorizing official or the PIPD. PPRs are due 30 days after each reporting period for the project period that just started, 9-30-2021 to 9-29-22. You can see your first report is due April 30th, 2022 for the first six month uh, reporting period. Your second report is due October 30th, 2022, for the second six-month period. Next slide, please. Your federal financial report, which we talked a little bit about already, you have the FFR and the FSR, must be completed and submitted through the payment management system. This FFR and FSR report, in addition to the quarterly FFR with PMS. The SF-425 is due semi-annually, and an annual SF-425 is due 90 days after the end of the budget period of 929. And it's due 30 days after the end of the reporting period. So you just count out 30 days after that six-month period. So basically, it's on the same schedule as your PPR, but it's completed in payment management system and not in grant solutions. So you can see on here, your first report would be due April 30th, 2022. The second report, October 30th, 2022. And the annual report would be December 30th, 2022. Next slide, please. The SF-428 report is regarding any tangible property, uh, for example, equipment and supplies. It has three parts, an annual report, a final for when you close out your uh, program or your award, your grant award, and a disposition request report. This you can, and it's an annual report. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> it is an annual report. I'm not sure if it's required uh, for this particular program, but you can submit that as a grant note and grant solutions. It is required for when you do close out your grant award. And I will, I'm leaving your guidelines, it is due annually. Uh, next slide, please. Grant solutions user roles. I've alluded to this a little bit before, but only the authorizing official and the PIPD roles and grant solutions have access to make any requests or upload documents. Other roles have read-only access. Uh, as I mentioned, there are six supporting roles that can read the reports or communications that can occur inside grant solutions, but the main access goes to the authorizing official or the PIPD. OGM, or your a specific grants management specialist is responsible for ensuring that the AO and PD for grants have access to grant solutions. And any direct questions, please. You can see that who your assigned grants management specialist is on the notice of award. Um, grantees control, submission of post award, submission amendments, and you can contact your grants management specialist who is identified on your notice of award with any specific questions. There are, as I said, specific grant support roles that you can also apply for through Grant Solutions uh, Help Desk, but the main roles are for the authorizing official and the PIPD. Next slide. So you have several types of post award uh, changes that require prior approval. First one is the change in scope or objective. Uh, this is pretty much self-explanatory. So 
if you vary uh, any variation to what has been approved um, to the to the scope or the uh, objectives, goals, and objectives of the grant award, must uh, must have prior approval before you can implement them. So that's contacting your uh, program officer, program specialist, uh, for them to review. And if not, and if it is approved, then we would submit, or you would create a post award amendment in grant solutions so that it can be officially recognized. Another is a change or absence in key personnel. This is specific to the AO or the PIPD. So if they're gonna be missing for more than three months, you would have to submit a budget modification. If there's a change in one of those two positions, you would have to uh, submit a change in grantee authorizing official or a change in PIPD amendment in grant solution. The transfer of funds budgeted for participant support. So um, this is between uh, budget categories, uh, no cost extensions. This is an extension of the performance period at the end of the project period can be anywhere from three months to 12 months, but it's only done at the end of the project period. Significant rebudgeting. Uh, significant rebudgeting would be if you're re requesting uh, new equipment, uh, you're requesting a new budget category that wasn't approved in the previous, uh, in your approved award, or a change in indirect cost rates. Um, and, of course, if there's a need for additional funds, this will require prior approval and will be discussed first with your project officer and in conjunction with your uh, assigned grants management specialist. Next slide, please. Uh, as I uh, already alluded to, uh, budget modifications, uh, you must submit them as an amendment through grant solutions. There are required documents for these amendments. You must provide a cover letter explaining the need for the modification. It should be signed by your grantee authorizing official and on organization letterhead. The SF-424, which is the first page of your application, there are revised SF-424A, which is the budget categories and a revised budget line item and budget justification and other supporting documents. So that depends on what the post award amendment is. If it's a no cost extension, it would be your SF-425. If it's a carryover, that would also include your SF-425, things of that nature. Um, there, you can visit the Grant Solutions uh, training video for instructions on post award amendments and submission at the address on their website. Um, once again, prior approval is not required for budget modifications when the federal share of award budget Right. Sorry about that. Um, so you do have some latitude with your budget modifications. You do, if it is two hundred fifty thousand dollars or twenty five percent of your total budget, you are required to submit a budget modification. If it is less, you must still discuss that with your program officer uh, or and your and your grants management specialist to ensure that it does not require a new amendment next slide please the carryover unobligated balances these funds are to be used to complete unfinished activities from the prior year and the cost should have been reflected in the approved prior year budget Carryover balances should be requested as soon as possible after the submission of the annual uh, financial status report. So that means after the 90 day liquidation period, you can submit your carryover. That way you're submitting an accurate account of what is actually unobligated and what activities have not been finished and you would like to request a carryover for. It must be submitted via the Managed Amendment uh, tab in Grant Solutions. The required documents are the cover letter, SF-424, SF-424A, line item budget, and justification showing carryover amount only, and the annual FSR showing your unobligated balance on line 10H. Next slide. No cost extensions. We talked a little bit about this as well, but this, no. Uh, Post award amendment is to request 
complete activity as a grant in the final year of the project period. So once again, no cost extensions are only at the end of the final year of the project period. Requests are not approved merely for the purpose of using unobligated balances or to spend down funds. A request should be made 45 days prior to the end of the project period and are one-time extensions up to 12 months. Uh, just a little caveat to that. If you uh, submit one for only six months, and then you realize you have to do it for the, another six months, uh, discuss that with your program officer as soon as possible. But the no cost extension can only be for up to 12 months. It does not authorize additional spending or any new activities beyond the purposes consistent with the original award. Next slide. You would have to follow the instructions and grant solutions for requesting a no-cost extension. This is also a tab within uh, post-award amendments. Uh, the request should include the SF-424, a cover letter once again, explaining the need for the revision of the expiration date, uh, your uh, reasons for it, and the remaining buys expected. All SF-425s and PPRs from previous and current budget periods must be on file. Please ensure that you are submitting all your required reports on a timely basis and they are in the system so that we can verify before submitting a request for the no-cost extension. Now we'll be turning it over to Laura Holsey and Lauren Murphy. Thank you, Bernard. I'm Laura Holsey with Mathematica, and um, you can go to the next slide if you would. Thank you. Mathematica supports um, ACF, FISB, and grantees related to performance measures. And today, my colleague Lauren Murphy and I would like to provide a brief introduction to the PMAPS project and the PREP performance measures. My next slide summarizes the PMAPS project, which Mathematica is conducting for ACF. There are two key components. The PM in PMAP stands for performance measures. Under this part of the project, we support PREP grantees and their subrecipients in collecting performance measures data. We provide TA and training on the measures through a series of webinars and guidance documents. And we operate a web-based system for grantees to submit their data to ACF. Once grantees submit their data, we analyze them and report to ACF, and we provide visualizations of the performance measures data to both ACF and grantees through an online dashboard. Finally, we disseminate performance measures findings to broader audiences, such as through conference presentations, fact sheets, and an interactive brief. The second half of PMAPS, the APS, stands for Adulthood Preparation Subjects. Under this part of the project, we've developed resources to assist PrEP grantees in understanding and implementing APS content in their programs. The resources include a report, which presents a conceptual model for each APS, as well as a unified framework that identifies commonalities and overlaps across the models. Combined, the conceptual models and framework are intended to help PrEP grantees understand how the addition of APS can improve outcomes for participating youth, develop APS-related content, and target specific outcomes in their programs. Complementing that report are three briefs. The first brief discusses strategies for addressing financial literacy within PrEP, including the importance of delivering content that is timely, sequential, relevant, and developmentally appropriate for youth. A second brief provides guidance on using the APS conceptual models to tailor prep programming to pregnant and parenting youth. And the final um, brief describes the value of a positive youth development approach in relation to the APS and how to integrate positive youth development into prep programming. Turning now to the performance measures, they serve three related purposes. They help ACF monitor program implementation including whether PREP objectives and legislative requirements are being met. Performance measures can create a foundation for program improvement efforts, 
by ensuring that grantees have data that they can use to assess their own and their subrecipients' performance and progress over time, and identify training and technical assistance needs. Finally, performance measures facilitate reporting information about PrEP to policymakers and legislators. As shown in the graphic in this slide, the performance measures originate from multiple levels. Each PrEP grantee reports data to ACF, including information at the grantee level, and also from providers, program models, and participants. To cover a couple of terminology um, issues here, providers in this context are the organizations working directly with youth. Some providers are subrecipients of a grantee, but other grantees act as providers themselves operating programs directly. Programs here refer to the curriculum model being implemented, and participants refer to the youth served, who provide data by completing entry and exit surveys, which will be aggregated to the program level for reporting to ACF. And now I'll turn the presentation over to my colleague, Lauren Murphy, who will provide more information on the performance measures themselves. Lauren? Hi, thank you, Laura. I'm happy to share an introduction to the PREP performance measures. You'll learn more detail about these measures at upcoming webinars. Dates of those are posted in a few slides. To start off, the PREP performance measures fall into three broad categories, and the frequency of submission and reporting periods vary by category. So you'll see the first measures are of measures of structure, cost, and support for program implementation, and those are submitted once a year and cover a full grant year from October through September. The other measures of attendance, reach, and dosage, and participants' characteristics, behaviors, program experiences, and perceptions of program effects are submitted twice a year, with each round covering the previous six months of programming. For instance, in the summertime, you would submit data covering January through June. So let's take a closer look at the first category, structure, cost, and support. Next slide. These measures are reported at the grantee, provider, and program level. The first set of measures describes how your grant is structured. You'll report on grantee and provider staffing, and you'll also describe how your, um, what programming is provided to youth, such as the actual program model implemented, which uh, APS you selected and how they're implemented, and intended delivery hours. Lastly, in this category, you'll report on target populations. Measures of cost include reporting on both PrEP grant funding and allocation and provider level funding. Lastly, in this category are measures of support for implementation. This includes reporting on training and technical assistance and observations, as well as implementation challenges providers face and the technical assistance needs they might have. Next slide. Thank you. The next category of measures is attendance, reach, and dosage. These measures are collected at the participant level, but aggregated to a program model level. Performance measures from attendance include the number of youth who attended at least one program session overall, and by grade grouping and by setting. A measure of program reach is based on whether at least 50% of youth served by each program model were from a specific population served by the PrEP program. Some examples include youth in foster care or youth in a juvenile justice system. Then there are measures of program dosage, such as the number of youth who complete at least 75% of the intended program hours, the number of program hours delivered to each cohort, and the number of completed cohorts overall for the reporting period. And in this case, a cohort refers to a group of youth who are served together. Next slide. The last category are measures of participant characteristics, behaviors, program experiences, and perceptions of program effects. And these measures are collected through participant entry and exit surveys, and once again, are reported at the aggregate by program model. Entry survey items include participant characteristics or demographics, such as age and race. Youth will also report on behaviors related to the six APS and sexual risk prior to participating in PrEP programming. 
Next, the exit survey items include the same set of participant characteristics from the entry survey. The exit survey also asks youth about their experiences in the program and their perceptions of effects of the PrEP program on their sexual risk behaviors and their preparation for adulthood. Next slide. So that's the introduction to our measures, but I'd like to point you to our PMAPS website, which is listed on the slide, prepeval.com, which provides more information on the APS reports and briefs, as well as information on the performance measures. I will note that there are revisions to the performance measures currently under review by OMB and updated, updated guidance materials are forthcoming pending approval. So the materials currently available on the website are from previous rounds of data collection that give you some insight into what performance measures look like. Next slide. Lastly, we have a set of training webinars that will discuss the measures further, as well as provide guidance on working with partners, working with IRBs, and as well as survey administration. And invitations for these webinars will, are forthcoming and will be sent out through our project help desk email, which is prep performance measures at mathematica-mpr.com. So be on a lookout for those. Thank you. So I am now happy to pass the presentation over to Samakal at OPRE. Thank you, Lauren, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Selma Ka'al. I am pleased to introduce you to the local evaluation support, uh, the LEA, the LES, um, or the evaluation technical assistance that CPREP grantees will receive. My colleague, Kathleen McCoy, and myself um, will oversee the evaluation support. Uh, we both work at the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation, and we will work with, in collaboration with FISB to support the PrEP local evaluations. So we can stay on this slide um, for, uh, for a little while longer. So before I go over an overview of the local evaluation support, I will give you a brief background on OPRE. So OPRE builds and disseminates knowledge about effective approaches to helping low-income children and families through rigorous research and evaluation projects, such as evaluations on existing programs and innovative approaches to help low-income children and families, research syntheses, and descriptive and exploratory studies. Now, as you see on our next slide, um, it, we, it, let me tell you a little bit about how OPRE fits in the work uh, that PrEP grantees are going to be doing. Let's look at this slide and the illustration. And as you see, FISB and OPRE reside within ACF. FISB partners with OPRE to conduct the national studies, support grantees, conduct local program evaluations, and also collect uh, performance measures. And we are partnering with them also to provide technical assistance uh, for evaluations. As you may know, FISB project officers um, oversee the CPREP grants, as this illustration shows, and CPREP grantees who propose to conduct a program evaluation will work with their independent local evaluator. Now, to provide support for your local evaluation, OPRE will oversee a contractor, in this case, APT Associates, who will provide local evaluation support to those of you who proposed a local evaluation. The contractor APT Associates will have a consulting, supportive relationship with FISB officers, grantees, and their local evaluators. And um, as you see here, the reason why the lines in consulting relationship is because that's, it, it's gonna be a collaborative, interactive um, relationship. Now let's move on to the next slide, please. Now um, let's talk a little bit about the goals and objectives of the local evaluation to support, uh, um, to support you. The goal of the LES um, is to support grantees in conducting high quality and rigorous descriptive or impact program evaluations depending on the evaluations that uh, grantees proposed. The objective of the LES is to guide grantees through the planning, implementation, data analysis, and reporting of those evaluations. We can move to the next slide, please. Now, the local evaluation support will be delivered in three main ways, um, such as the ones that we have here. Um, and here we provide some examples of how, you know, within those ways. Now, please keep in mind that some of these activities um, 
were are fluid at this point because the contractor uh, was recently awarded and also um, they would like to contact uh, grantees on maybe some best approaches uh, to providing the evaluation support that they may need. But let's talk about the first way to deliver evaluation technical assistance. Um, the first way is by providing grantee specific support. So that's, the contractor will develop templates for grantees to, to help them design their local evaluations. Uh, uh, also um, will provide uh, templates to propose a, a data analysis plan and also will provide some guidance on the fi their final report you know, in, in, in a form of a template. The contractor will also provide feedback in the templates that the grantees complete and will hold conference calls to provide technical assistance and guidance throughout the whole project. They will also ensure that evaluations are progressing according to the timeline and um, again, always being in touch with, with grantees. Now, the second way by which they will provide uh, technical assistance is by um, providing group-based level evaluation support. The contractor will hold webinars on various topics such as evaluation design or, um, or maybe also webinars on how to complete the templates and any other webinars that, uh, that perhaps uh, the grantees may be in need or depending on where the evaluation uh, phase is. The third way for uh, providing local evaluation support is by developing and providing training resources. Uh, the contractor will develop toolkits, guides, or manuals on how to complete templates. Uh, they will develop a project website and where uh, information will be will be stored and allow all communicate. It, it will allow communications between grantees, uh, grantees with uh, with a contractor, and also uh, grantees with uh, the federal staff. And so it will be sort of like a hub for a lot of these uh, tools, materials, and also for communication. Now, um, next slide, please. Now, because we recently awarded uh, the contract to APT Associates, they were not able to, uh, to participate in today's um, presentation, but they will invite grantees to attend the webinar in the next few weeks to introduce themselves and provide more in-depth information about their approach to providing local evaluation uh, support, and then also to give you, sort of introduce you to, uh, to themselves and to who you will be working with. So please stay tuned with that for that information. And um, I think with that, I will turn it over to Kanika Hole from RTI, RTI International, but thank you very much for, uh, for your attendance. Good afternoon. I am Kanika Hall, a research analyst and training and technical assistance provider with RTI International. I will be briefly speaking on training and technical assistance that RTI and our contractors provide. Next slide. I'm sorry, can you go back one slide? Thank you. RTI, along with our contractors listed, provide tra training and technical assistance to prep grantees and serve as a resource for your programs. I would like to congratulate you on your awards. Next slide. So what is TA? So as technical assistance providers, we provide customized assistance to support and strengthen your program. This assistance can span from helping define problems, addressing already identified problems, helping you flesh out and develop new solutions, or bouncing around new ideas of things to try in your programming, but ensuring that you're maintaining fidelity. Our TA providers have expertise in program planning and implementation and management, staff recruitment and retention, virtual implementation, evidence-based and informed practices, sexual health and risk avoidance education, sustainability, and a host of other areas that may be helpful for you as you implement your program. We take time to get to know you and your program so that together we can work to find the best methods to address your needs. We provide complimentary services in a variety of formats. Next slide. At no cost again to your program, we provide webinars, tip sheets, hold office hours, host an annual conference, and have a website dedicated to resources to support your programming. So how do you access our services? Next slide. There are opportunities to participate in small group TA offerings, 
We sent out e-blast announcing times, dates, and connection information, and we share that regularly. If you are not receiving at least one e-blast a month, please reach out to us so that we can ensure you are on our listserv. You can also refer to the events page on the Exchange website for the most current information. I will demonstrate the Exchange shortly. You may also be contacted for Proactive TA to see if you are interested in assistance on special or emerging topics. This year, we are particularly interested in exploring ways to connect grantees with the same TA provider, as well as with other grantees with similar interest and needs as a way to facilitate collaboration and increase idea sharing. For individual TA, please contact your FISB project officer who will create a TA request for assistance. Next slide. Once a ticket is created, a TA provider will work with you to schedule a meeting to discuss your needs and will assist you directly until your needs are met. Your project officer will be informed of the progress of this TA and will be notified when the request has been closed. Next slide. As mentioned, there are two events that we'd like to highlight. They are topical trainings and the grantee conference, which again is tentatively being planned for June 28th through 30th, 2022 in Atlanta, Georgia. Two key staff members from your project are required to attend both events so that your program can benefit from new information and skills covered, face-to-face -face time with project officers and networking. Grantees will be receiving an invitation soon to nominate staff to participate in the grantee planning committee for the upcoming year's conference. So please keep a lookout for that email. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about the Exchange website. As you prepare to begin your programs, please review the resources on the Exchange. Um, we're going to have the chat um, box, a link place in the chat box for how to access this website. Once on the page, make sure you look in the top right corner and click register so that you're able to see all of the materials that are hosted on the site. Next, scroll all the way to the bottom and sign up for the email updates and the newsletters. So again, we send out information regularly. And if you are not receiving at least one email a month, please reach out to us to make sure that you are able to receive those materials. Next slide. Next, if you um, navigate to the resource tab, there you will find tip sheets, infographics, podcasts, toolkits, previous webinars, and other resources that may be useful. Next slide. Also review the events tab, which will have a up-to-date calendar of upcoming events. You can also check out the new grantee welcome package link which is on the left-hand menu, which has a lot of excellent material to get you started. Next slide. There is also a connect tab, which contains a comment wall where grantees can share successes, new ideas and strategies directly with each other, as well as pick up tips from TA providers. Next slide. So congratulations again on your award. Please contact us if we can be of any assistance. We look forward to working with you. I will turn the presentation over to my colleague, Barry Burgess, who will discuss We Think Twice. All right, thank you, Kanika. And I am excited today to be sharing with you about the We Think Twice campaign. And um, as you see, we're, we'll be talking about the We Think Twice. We think it's going to be a wonderful resource for you. And more importantly, we think it's going to be a wonderful resource for the youth that you are serving. As the next slide shows, we're going to talk about just a basic overview for the exchange today. Uh, I'm sorry, for the We Think Twice campaign today. And then we will talk to you about some of the things that are included in the campaign itself. One of the best parts of the We Think Twice campaign, in my view, is that youth are involved in all aspects of the campaign. It's truly a digital media campaign developed for youth, with youth. And the goals of the campaign are to really start to shift perceptions and social norms 
and help youth to resist negative peer pressure and also to build knowledge around things like creating healthy relationships, setting goals for the future, feeling empowered to make healthy decisions. All of these things you'll recognize as things that directly support the goals of the APP program and the actual grants that you're implementing. So again, we hope you're gonna find it's a great resource for you as you're working through things. On the next slide, we talk about some of the different components. We have multiple prongs for the We Think Twice campaign, including our We Think Twice Instagram account, which has now almost 2,800 followers and growing every day. We have a We Think Twice website that houses the materials and resources that we've developed along with numerous other resources that um, can be shared with your youth. And I'm proud to be able to say that our We Think Twice website actually received first place award of excellence in the 2021 Blue Pencil and Gold Screen Awards that are offered by the National Association of Government Communicators. So we were very proud of that. We also have a variety of other digital tools that are designed for youth and youth serving professionals. And a number of these have been um, selected for awards as well, but we, we hope you'll find them useful and we will always welcome any feedback you have on any of the materials that we have to share. So please feel free to reach out if you have suggestions or unmet needs that you'd like to see us address. In our next slide, we show some of the metrics for what we've done through the We Think Twice um, campaign so far. And as you can see, we have had over 13 million impressions. We have reached over 3 million youth and we have had 48,000 profile visits. Our organic engagement rate, which is the amount of that youth interact with the site is around 34% and the industry standard is around 3%. So we're very proud that we have youth engaged at that level. We also have had good success with the We Think Twice website. We've had 104,000 users since it was launched and about 145,000 page views. And users we find even scroll down <laughs> to look at things more than just the page they're on for about 30% of the cases. So we're, we're very pleased that they have engaged in the website like they have. Next slide, please. This just shows some of the examples of some of the top performing content I, uh, that we've had for the We Think Twice campaign so far. Um, on the left, you'll see our Instagram content and some of the things that folks have really liked and engaged with. And then some examples on the right of things that you can find on the website that also might be useful for your youth. And we hope you'll share that with them. On the next slide, we ask for your help. We hope that you will follow us on, on Instagram at We Think Twice. And we hope that you also will engage with the website at wethinktwice.org. Most importantly, we hope that you will ask your youth to engage with us and really participate in the campaign. So feel free again to reach out if you have any questions and we look forward to hearing from you. And at this point, I will pass it to Labrita White. Thank you so much, Barry. And we are in the final stretch for today's webinar. I just wanna start by saying good afternoon to our competitive prep grantees and congratulations on your FY 2021 grant awards. You are officially our third cohort of competitive prep grants or grantees. So I know you've received a significant amount of information on this afternoon, and I'll conclude the orientation session with providing a few highlights on medical accuracy review, that process, as well as to share brief closing remarks. So related to the medical accuracy review, and we can move to the next slide, as you are aware, and also that's a part of the, uh, that was a part of the notice of funding opportunity announcement um, or NOFO, um, there was information on ensuring that all curricula and program materials have medically accurate and complete information. And on this slide, you'll see um, the definition for medical accuracy. 
And um, I think what's really key for you to keep in mind when we discuss or talk about and as we move forward with some of the processes for the review of materials to ensure that accuracy and completeness, um, again, what is key is to ensure that the information provided to you is both verified and supported by scientific research. Next slide. Okay, so for the medical um, accuracy reviews, there are definitely, um, it's an important process, and there are two critical reasons. One, medical information is constantly evolving, it's changing, and as new discoveries are made, program materials can become outdated. And so the obvious is to ensure that program materials are accurate, complete, up-to-date when, when that information um, is shared with you. All right, so some of the potential medical accuracy issues are um, stated here. And the issues that are addressed in the review are typically related to information that's inaccurate, incomplete, um, outdated, poorly referenced, or supported by non-scientific studies. And some examples of such are polling data or opinions, um, information that could be um, construed as being confusing or misleading, and um, what's not stated here, but I'd like to also add, is any information that's contradictory to the program requirements um, for competitive prep grantees and all of our grant programs, um, once you receive those grant awards, it's contingent upon um, implementing projects that conform to the legislation, as well as the program requirements that are outlined in the NOFO. And Christine covered um, quite a few of those requirements today. So we wanna make sure that um, all of your information is complete in that way that it responds to the program requirements. Next slide. All right, so grantees should conduct an initial review of their program materials for medical accuracy prior to submitting to the Family and Youth Services Bureau, um, the APP program. And so we have contractors that are supporting the effort for the medical accuracy review process. Um, that contractor is Gray Matters, and they have a subcontractor that some of you may be familiar with. Um, if this is your second or third grant with us, um, an organization uh, called Paltech, and they will primarily be providing the consultants that have a medical background um, to review your information that's submitted. If you're using program materials that can be modified, um, issues found, um, should be corrected prior to submission. Additionally, um, grantees are encouraged to independently review materials on a regular basis and make updates as needed. So it's not a one and done process because we do know um, data um, stats and information does change from time to time. So based on past experience, we've noted during the review process that some grantees opt to select alternate curricula to ensure that the intervention um, fully conforms to the program requirements um, and include medical, medically accurate information. So reviewing the curricula and all other program materials carefully um, to ensure that um, program implementation, again, conforms with competitive prep, that the information is accurate. Um, so in, what we found is that sometimes grantees will make a change in the curricula from what they initially um, included in their application. It doesn't happen often, um, it happens rarely, but it can happen, it has happened. Um, and again, um, just we wanna make you aware of that. For example, if um, a grantee has discovered that there are major issues throughout the program materials and they require considerable modifications, um, they may, or grantees, you may um, consult with your federal project officer to explore the use of other curricula. Again, it doesn't happen very frequently, but it has and it can and just wanted to make you aware of that. What we want to make sure is that young people are receiving um, the most updated, accurate information. And also, um, we want to ensure again that the program requirements are adhered to. Grantees are also to submit materials to the Family News Services Bureau, and I already spoke about our contractors that are supporting that process. Grantees are to respond to and address inaccuracies 
um, using various methods that could include making modifications to the actual curriculum text, creating an insert with updated information that facilitators can refer to and use in program implementation, um, selecting a different or supplemental brochure, video, handout, or et cetera uh, for program implementation. And what's really important, uh, we do not encourage any significant changes to curricula without um, consultation with the developer of that curricula. That's really um, critical. We want to ensure that we're not violating any copyright um, privileges there. So in November, we will be hosting a medical accuracy review webinar to provide you with more information, detailed information on the process and instructions on how to submit materials. Um, if you have questions prior to the medical accuracy review specific webinar, we ask that you consult with your assigned federal project officer um, and we'll get you answers to any of the questions that you may have. But um, rest assured in November, you will, will receive updated detailed information specifically on that process, okay? All right, and we'll move to the next slide. And here you'll see a list of our contractors. You've been introduced to all of them on today um, through some representation uh, with, the, with the presentations that were made uh, for this orientation webinar. Um, so again, you're acquainted with a number of them and we stand ready, they stand ready to provide you with support and assistance as you implement your competitive prep projects. Um, the tr training and technical assistance that they will be providing to you is at no cost. And so we do encourage you to take advantage of their um, expertise and support. Next slide. So here is a list as we close out today's webinar of the most popular and frequently used websites um, by our grantees. There's a plethora of information that's located on each site. Um, to provide you with guidance on your grant related activities. So please um, don't hesitate to utilize those resources in addition to our TNTA contractors and also um, consulting with your experience and knowledgeable federal project officers. So before we move into questions and answers, I'd like to reiterate that we're looking forward to a successful three year project period as you implement your competitive prep projects with service delivery to the most high-risk youth across the nation and U.S. territories. As we partner over the next few years, be reminded that the APP program staff, our contractors, again, we're here to support you in accomplishing the overall overarching goal of preventing teen pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections, as you also work to teach young people skills to support their successful transition to adulthood. The complement of those three key important services um, are crucial. We know there will likely be challenges along the way. Um, we're in the midst of one right now, this pandemic, but um, just know that if we have open and transparent communication, um, we utilize those innovative ideas, creativity, and we work cooperatively together, inevitably we will um, definitely have success success is inevitable. So this success is also contingent upon um, your partners. You have, as grantees, you have contractors, you also have sub-recipients. I want to encourage you um, this afternoon and to invite you to share information um, with those partners. It's really critical for your success as a grantee to make sure that everyone that touches and is affiliated with your project has the same information. They have access to your application. They have access to the NOFO, access to the training and TA that we will be providing. Um, that collegial partnership is super critical. You're further encouraged to review the recording of today's webinar and to refer um, to your grantee guidance document that you should have received from your assigned project officer. Um, emails should have gone out already. Um, for you to be notified of who your assigned project officer is, um, as well as there was an attachment of the grantee guidance document and maybe some other information, including um, their request to begin scheduling regular meetings to check in on your progress. 
And so um, please utilize today's webinar and those other resources to guide you in the management of your grant. Again, I wanna say congrats. Thanks for your participation in today's webinar. And uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and move forward with our question and answer session. I know that there are a few questions in the chat box. So at this time, Katie Sullenthrop with RTI will moderate uh, the questions um, or share those questions and we will work to respond to as many as we possibly can on this afternoon. For those that we may not be able to respond to um, today, again, feel free to follow up with your federal project officer. Katie, do you have Great. any questions? Yeah, there was a question about, uh, the, I was just gonna answer one very quickly um, about whether or not local evaluators can register for the exchange. And you're more than welcome to do that. Your exchange point of contact can get you signed up your grantee point of contact. There was also a question about, um, and Labrita, I'll, I'll turn this over to you. Do all the curricula have to be submitted for review for example, approved if, if they've selected an approved evidence-based curricula, do they still have to get that re-approved? Uh, for the medical accuracy review, it's a different type of review versus the, um, if they're referring to the teen pregnancy prevention evidence review or other, ev or other scientific studies that may have been conducted. So the answer to that question is yes, they will have to submit. In that we know that many of our grantees have um, propose to use similar or the same curricula. We will not ask every single grantee to submit uh, multiple versions of the same. Um, so that's why we wanna coordinate and also have a follow-on um, webinar. And we'll be providing additional information in November on which grantees are required to submit um, what specific information. But yes, we do need to have all curricula medically accurately reviewed. Great, and do we have a date for that webinar yet, Labrita, or it sounds like more information is forthcoming? We do not have a specific date, but it is forthcoming um, within the next week, or if not less, you should receive an invite, um, or at least a save the date for that. Great. There was a question about how many applicants there were for the competitive grant. Okay, I do not recall that specific number, so I'm gonna ask Christine if she can chime in. To respond to that question. <laughs> yes, um, good question. So we received 43 applications and 36 of them um, went through the competitive review process. Thank you, Christine. And the next question, um, and I think this is for Bernard, can you please confirm a carryover unobligated balance 90 days after the end of the year or before the year ends? And I can repeat that if you'd like. Yes, <laughs> the carryover should be submitted uh, 90 days after the end of the budget period. So that gives you time to complete your annual FSR and have an accurate accounting of what is actually unobligated. So that's 90 days after the end of the budget period. Great, thank you. Cameron, there was a request, I don't know if you can find in the slides, the dates for the performance measure webinars, um, or maybe Meredith, if you could put those back up, that would be great. I believe it's slide 52. Awesome. Um, also, Laura, while we have you, there was a question about what, when can they expect, or maybe this is for Selma, I'm sorry, to receive the local evaluation plan template. Um, yes, hi. Um, what I'm, uh, I'm thinking that it will be uh, sometime early next year uh, when we receive, uh, when you will receive the template because it does have to go uh, through OMB approval and that's going to, um, you know, we have to take that into consideration in our timeline. And, and can you clarify some as early next year as in like calendar year or federal fiscal year? Oh yeah, um, it's calendar year. Great, thank you. Another question. Um, well, there's a couple more. The curriculum they select, this, this grantee selected, this is from Carmen, um, for middle school does not have a condom lesson that they believe is a requirement from the NOFO. Would they be able to provide a lesson as an alternative lesson in an after school setting? 
our, their partners and the School Health Association Committee indicated what they can and cannot present. Um, for that particular question, I would um, recommend that, that, that the person who asked that question refer that to their specific project officer because there may be some um, nuances and other factors uh, to be discussed that's specific to that particular program and site. So if you can refer that question specifically to your project officer and we will respond. Great, thank you. There's another question. Prior to funding, we had to make budget changes. When do we need to submit our new work plan and does that need to be approved? For the new work plans that were required, West are modified work plans that were requested um, based on the notice of award, um, those specifications. There should have been a time frame um, stated. I wanna say it was within 30 days of award, but please refer back to your um, notice of award and also check in with your federal project officer. Great, and then there's a, a final question, but please continue to add questions if you have any more. Can we request a particular person to work with for TA? And um, when the TA request comes in from the project officer, you can request a particular TA mm -hmm. provider. And I'll just do a shameless plug. We are having a office hours on October 28th where you can meet all of the TA providers. So um, you should have received a save the date for that today as well. Any other questions? I don't see anything else if I have missed you somehow. Um, I apologize for those of you that had questions about updated performance measures. Those are answered um, in a written format. They're hoping to have that before the November 8th performance measure webinar. And then um, we are hoping to make these slides available in the exchange as soon as possible so that you can share them with your team or any subrecipients as appropriate. And one thing to add about the performance measures too, Katie, um, just to direct grantees to the prepeval.com website, where you can take a look at the measures of structure, cost, and support, as well as the measures of attendance, reach, and dosage, um, which are staying consistent and you will be reporting on. Um, we currently also have up the current performance measures, um, entry and exit surveys, which you can take a look at. Um, but like Laura has answered, um, the revised surveys are under review um, and we will be hoping to get review and sharing them with you all prior to the November 8th webinar um, where we'll introduce them. So it sounds like those are, we're hoping to get those approved very, very soon. Um, I know it sounds like a lot of folks need to submit for IRB. So hopefully that will be coming very soon. This is Laura, if, if, if I might add just, just one thing. Um, the changes are not large and they are primarily deletions. So if, if grantees wanted to get started on their OMB packages, obviously you would, sorry, your IRB packages, obviously you need the final surveys before you can submit them. But if you wrote up the rest of your IRB submission using the versions that are the old versions that are posted right now, I don't think you would have to change much other than just attaching the correct versions of the surveys once they're approved. Great, thank you, Laura, that's really helpful. So hopefully people can get started. Excellent. I think I'm gonna turn it back to you, Labrita, to close this out. I don't see any other questions. Okay, excellent. Again, thank you everyone for joining today's um, new grantee orientation session. I also um, want to share a special thanks to Christine Zakor, who is the lead for competitive prep and all of the other federal partners, as well as um, contractor staff who helped to share information or did share information on this afternoon. We hope you will find this information to be helpful to you. Again, um, this is not a one and done. Um, there's lots of information resources. This webinar also will make, be made available to you for re-review for sharing with your partners and or with staff that were not able to participate um, on today. So again, thank you so much for joining. Again, um, congratulations. We look forward to um, a successful project period and stay tuned for additional 
um, eblast on upcoming webinars with information related to performance measures, medical accuracy reviews, and uh, other, um, other critical components for your projects. Again, thank you everyone and have a great evening.